Friday, thank you uh, for joining the Sports Editor. So good to chat about rugby and, and your career and what you've been up to. But we're first going to start with your international career. And you made your debut for Zimbabwe in 2015, I think at about the tender age of 20. Um, and Zimbabwe seems to have a tendency of, of grooming young players, getting them in international setup. Um, has it been working? Is there, is there continuation? Um, but I would say it's, it's a bit mixed. Um, because, um, like South Africa in many ways, Zimbabwe's high, um, school rugby um, is quite a big thing. Um, but I think where there's um, where the problem lays is that the kids that are coming out of high school don't actually want to play for the Zimbabwe Sables. They would rather um, play for the Springboks because of the beasts and the brand majorities and the Tundarai Chivangas, the guys that have come before us. So they usually look towards that route or coming over to the UK um, and doing it. So I think that's where the missing link is. And that has, or that would get better if Zimbabwe were performing um, at a higher level um, consistently um, in Africa and each and every single year. Um, even if I take myself for an example, I only found out about the Zimbabwe Sables when my brother made his debut, which was two years before I made my debut. So when sure. I was, when I was in matric, that's when my brother made his debut for Zimbabwe. So that's the first time I'd ever heard of the Zimbabwe Sables. Um, <laughs> so that's, sure. that, so that, I think that paints a picture for you. So um, yes. for me, it was a bit different because that Springbok dream could have been a reality because of um, because of me going to school in South Africa and being in the system already. Um, mm. Yeah, it's, it's good. Because I mean, you you've done well for the country because you, you actually scored on on debut, made a great impression. But but you know you you touched on it slightly there. But what are some of the limits that Zimbabwe faces when it comes to specifically qualifying? For the Rugby World Cup? I would say it's um, consistent funding. So there's, oh, wow. been, there's been a trend um, over the last two World Cup qualifying campaigns that have been involved in where we sort of aren't building up towards the World Cup and we sort of leave it um, uh, a year before, a year before, sure. a couple of months. And I mean, we don't have the luxury of being in camp for for long periods of time because people work. Um, I I am lucky because rugby is all I I do essentially, so I have that luxury of really coming into camp, focusing, and True. when I when I arrive in, in in Zim camp, I'm usually in in really good shape because of um, the level I'm training at over here in the UK. So. I think it's the consistent consistent funding that needs to um, happen. That needs there needs to be a set plan for four years, and we say in the next four years, what are we doing um, towards getting to the Rugby World Cup? But I will say in this period, um, there's small signs of of continuation, and the best we've probably done in terms of getting guys game time leading up to the World Cup. I think we were. In the Super Sport Challenge last year, brilliant, so, brilliant. Yeah. So our coach um, Brendan Dawson, um, he's had a chance to play a couple of players, and obviously that he was going to get that opportunity again this year. Um, but sure, because of the current climate and the pandemic we're going through, um, that's obviously been laid off for till further notice. So yeah. yeah. Interesting. So you guys have some challenges, but it looks like there, there is an effort to get on our track because it would be great to have another African country competing at the Rugby World Cup. Would it yeah, be sure. absolutely? <laughs> but talking about um, how your your career started off, you end up in France and you went to the French Academy. I think it's called. Uh, my pronunciation's got to be right. Yeah. Yeah. Catch me. Yeah. Say, well, yeah, really. or, or, yeah. I can never get it right. Yeah. Uh, and they just, those countries seem to have their rugby programs almost a step above the others that you've experienced? Um, yes. Yes. 
yes and no. I think the beauty of it is they have, um, well, in terms of at that age group level, they have a what is called an Espoir League. And in that Espoir League is um, your academy teams, basically. So that's where you get your, your game time. And that's a fully, those are fully functional leagues. And there are three of them. So you go in tiers from your top 14 to your pro team to, to your third division teams. And these teams all have their youth teams playing rugby each and every single weekend, a full season that's running uh, in line with the with the with the pro season, and in yeah, some cases, yeah, yeah, and in some and in some cases, you even get players that are coming back from injury um, from the sure. pro team filtering in, or the younger contracted players um, playing and getting their game time on the weekend in the espoir. So, I think that's good. But then, when I say the bad side of it is. The French league obviously attracts a lot of marquee um, yeah. top players that are sort of at the yeah. end of their or they're done with their international aspirations and they they come over to to France and then they sort of have to battle out for their places. But I do think the French youngsters do get a great opportunity, and that's testament to the team they have now, which is a really young. Team. Yeah, and that's, that's some of really and some well. of the guys, some of the guys I was playing with in my time there have broken through into that team, which is nice to see. They make up the majority of that team. I played almost against all those guys at at that Espoir level, so it's good that they've come through. Yeah, I'm sure they they were bleak when the virus hit because it looked like France are going to win the Six Nations quite easily. Yeah, so they, yeah, yeah, they had a good, good, good <laughs> yeah. chance. Yeah, but talking about fighting your way through. You're one meter eighty-five, weigh one hundred twenty kgs. What's it like playing on the wing? Uh, <laughs> I do, I, I do, I do like playing with the ball in hand. I do like playing with the ball in hand. You'll find me there, <laughs> probably trying to catch a break. It's brilliant. Yeah. How are you? Uh, the dynamics of of scrumming for Worcester. Uh, for Worcester, we we're really lucky. We have um, Meth and Davies. Uh, who is our well, ex coach now? He's he's off to drag um, dragons in Wales. He actually played for, he actually played for Wales. Sure. Uh, not if I'm not mistaken. Probably six for more than fifty caps, I would say. Wow. And he's a Leicester Tigers legend too. Um, at hooker, so we we have him. I've never had a coach or a scrum coach that can simplify um, my job or the role I'm supposed to execute on the weekend. And he takes a more um, team approach, uh, scrumming as an eight um, approach to to the game. So it just really helps that he's there. Yeah. And you'll, be, you'll be shocked to know that he goes through the steps. So it's not just the main focus is on the front row. Yes, we have to do the business at the end of the day, but then... There's specific roles that the flanks, the locks, and the eighth man have to um, perform on the weekend, so we can execute and and play well. So I, I would say it's really good to have him, and I'm actually lucky also to well, we were lucky at Worcester to have um, Nick Charnett, uh, who's a Marysburg College old boy. Um, yeah, he's he's a phenomenal scrummager and sort of he's sort of been my mentor while I've been here, and. Um, he just his understanding of scrumming and his execution on the weekend um, is just yeah phenomenal. He's probably one of the best. I'll, yeah, probably one of the best scrummages in the, that we have in the in the Premiership at the moment. And um, yeah, it's really good to have a guy like him um, sort of showing you the ropes and um, where you can get better. Yeah, because I must say the the attention to detail seems really really good. Like you're saying, they're quite good at just explaining what to do. And there's that sort of a support, get there, do your thing, carry on. It's very detailed. It's very, and like you said, similar piece. So you just even feel more confident. Yeah. And then you scrub even harder. Well, I know you do at least. So I don't know about yeah. the rest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've obviously scrubbed a lot. You know, you've been obviously South Africa, France, and you moved across to Worcester 2018, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, 2018. 2018. And is it very different to how we scrum here in South Africa? I know you said about the details, but just in terms of like intensity, is there quite a difference there? Or are they very much in a par in the different countries that you've scrummed in? Um, what I would say the difference is, I think in South Africa, I think more more emphasis is put on the individual. So there'll be your one on one, your one on one battle. So a certain props trying to do something um, <laughs> on his own, and 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 that works. You you have some guys that that mm. dominate and do that really well. I mean, Beast is one of them. I would say he can yeah. sort of go on his own, and because of his experience, he he can get results. And he's just he's also a phenomenal scrummager. But then I find that here uh, in the UK, the scrums are it's a very eight v eight v eight. All right. Okay. Where Since, sort of mm. counter punching in a way where you see what the the other team's gonna bring. Um, and also, what's different about the UK? or the premiership, our founders, or especially in the premiership, all the clubs are scrumming differently. Oh, wow. So it's a different challenge every week. Sure. Um, but if I if I look at the, the All Blacks, for example, uh, or New Zealand, they scrum across the board. It looks very similar because they have... Yeah. Mike goes around the clubs and is telling them what they must do there. There's a very... You see, there's a, sure. team, there's a combined effort there. But mm. when you play against Gloucester, it's going to be different personnel doing different things. If you go down to, to London and you're playing Saracens, it's going to be a different story. So each and every single weekend, you're challenged. Um, and that's what, yeah, that's what I've found across the board in terms of those, those leagues. Sure. Yeah. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. So talk about that. Who's this, your toughest opponent you've ever scrummed against? Um, I think probably is it that easy? Uh, no, <laughs> there's so many. There's, there's so many. I'd probably, <laughs> I'd probably say Ethan Waller here at the, at the Warriors is quite strong, and he just I think the irritating thing about him is he he gets out the blocks really quickly. Oh, very, wow, very explosive. Okay. So you sort of have to use a couple of tricks to, to slow him down. <laughs> with I'm your, sure you can. Whether it's with your mind or something, you, you have to slow him down a little bit. But yeah, he's, he's really strong and, and fast too. It's quick, mm. very explosive scr scrummager. Okay. Callum Black That's also here at the Warriors is pretty good. He just, he just doesn't move. <laughs> <laughs> you can try me, he just doesn't move. <laughs> yeah. no, that's awesome. Uh, for us, quickly come back to your, your time here in South Africa. You, you attended Marker House, very well known for rugby. Um, it, what was the motivation, sort of what brought you to say, right, Marker House, that's the school for me, I want to go there? Okay, so it's funny. Um, I was at school at St. John's Prep in, in Harare, Zimbabwe. Okay. Mm. And um, uh, we were there, and then he had a his best mate at at, at school at the time. Um, his um, father was the um, the headmaster of St John's um, College, the high school um, uh, in Harare at the time. But he had worked at Mike Louse in the past. Okay, um, as a housemaster, and. Um, there was this idea that he got, well, yeah, they, then they, my brother actually eventually went on to go visit the school because that's where Paul, his mate, was always going to go to school. Um, and that's what his dad had chosen for him. Although his dad was the head master of St. John's <laughs> College at the time. Um, yeah. So they made that decision. And then my brother went there to go visit um, with my parents. Um, and then, yeah. As soon as they they drove in, they actually know. I lied. They actually visited Marysburg College first. Okay. They thought that was really good. They thought that yeah. was really good, and then 
they went to my class after, and then as soon as they drove in, they said, um, yeah, we have, to, we have to go. <laughs> and then I spent a year, so my brother went into grade eight, um, and then I spent a year back at home still at St. John's Prep, and then I, my, my parents, because at the time in 2008, I, I'm sure you would know things in Zim were tough. Yeah. The inflation rates, fuel queues, um, food yeah. changes and the rest. So I don't think it was, my parents didn't think at least it was a good environment for me to be in. And my parents' jobs require a lot, they required at the time a lot of traveling. So I would be at home um, some weekends with um, an aunt or an uncle or, or my grandparents. So that became tough. And then eventually my mom mm. just asked me, would you want to go to school? Would you want to go to boarding school? And then I said, yes, I'll go to boarding school as long as it's in South Africa. Then I went to, then the, a week later, I was at Cord Wallace doing an interview. Okay. I was at Cord Wallace, did, okay. my inter, did my interview at Cord Wallace, and then, um, yeah, a couple of months later, I was buying uniforms and all that. Then, yeah, I went through, yeah, I went in grade five, and then I finished the rest of my prep school stuff there. Then, obviously, the the automatic route was to was to go to my class thereafter. Brilliant. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, because, you know, obviously, you know, there's, there's quite a few old boys that have gone there and they've <clears throat> made it through. And there's obviously a very good rugby play, uh, program there. But in your time, there, what contributed to the rugby program being so successful at Marker House? I think it was just the culture and the drive. Like, I think if you look at... If you just look at my class boys, the way they, they play their rugby, we would spend four hours on a on a rainy on a rainy day just playing touch in the rain. And I would say for the most part, that's where my screws my level my skills grew. And um, even tackling someone who was older than you, for example. Yeah. You had to you had to do things like that there. Um, so there was already there was already that as a um, as a foundation, and then it was just easy for the coaches. Now, when you brought the players to come train, the players wanted to train all the time. We wanted to work hard and do well, and the dream was obviously to play um, first team rugby because of everything that came yeah. with that <laughs> at the time. <laughs> That's true. You're one, yeah, you're one of the boys. So I think. Yeah, the, and the coaches also, I think they would get the same feedback from young kids that wanted to learn. And at the time, we had um, Reno Kornbrink as mm. our head of, head of rugby, who's uh, who's done well in South African rugby and in coaching. I think he's at Paul Ruiz now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Paul, Paul Ruiz, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. He should be there, yeah. So he... He was at the at the top there in terms of being the head of rugby, and he just um, did it so well. And I think he had young kids that wanted to learn and do and succeed at the same time. So I think it was a combination of both. Sure, that's brilliant. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Well, it's good to see that you've done so well. Thank you. I appreciate and one, that. yeah, that's perfect. One big event that happens every year yeah. is the, the derby against against Hilton. Yeah. Um, and in your time there, did you did you have the upper hand? <laughs> it was pretty. E they had a really good team. Mm -hmm. They did have a good team. So and uh, under fourteen, we yeah, under four from under fourteen, we struggled, but we won a couple. To be fair, I think under sixteen we got the better of them, and in under fifteen, and then in the first team year they they got Cameron Wright, who's um, oh, oh well, there we go. They got the camera mm -hmm. right from who's at the, the Sharks now, and also a guy that uh -huh. I know really well, very nice guy. And uh, they had him in in the last grade eleven and, and grade twelve year, and he he carved up for, for sure. He was so yeah. He was a main player, putting um, hundred meter box kicks up in the air for for our fullbacks to catch. Yeah, but, so yeah, difficult. We, yeah, so we lost we lost in in matric. Unfortunately. Mm. Ah, that's okay. As long as you still. Hopefully. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, for us, we, we sort of draw to an end here. Um, you involved in a, in a fundraising effort for Zimbabwe with regards to the virus. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so that's being headed by Marshall, Marshall Gore, who actually got in touch with me. Um, I met him at, a, at an awards dinner last year uh, sometime, and um, we sort of exchanged numbers then, and then he, he got hold of me. And that's just an effort we're trying to make um, as the people in the, in the diaspora or overseas here. Um, that's just an effort we're trying to make for, for people back home where um, we don't have the luxuries of resor resources they have over here um, in, in the first world. Um, so, yeah, that's just an effort we're trying to make to, to help people back home um, in this fight with, with COVID-19. Well, that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Well done, Farai. Yeah, cheers. Uh, good. Yeah. Farai, I just want to say thank you for your time. It's been really good to chat to you about your career. And I'm sure we're going to hear more about you because you're yeah. working really hard yeah. and you're yeah. creating an impression. It's, it's brilliant. No, for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. I, re I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Farai, you're a legend, my man. No, thank you so much for your No, anytime, man. You look after yourself, man. Eh? You too. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, man. Bye.